Hello everybody, this is Ian Williams, President of the Foreign Press Association in New York, and we're speaking with Anna Holm, who is in the north of, I think it's the north, isn't it, of Norway, and That's right. is, is editor of the High North News, which is fascinating. It sounds like a sort of Arctic marijuana magazine, but it isn't. <laughs> It's, it's uh, I think, the only newspaper that's exclusively exclusively dedicated to local news in the Arctic. It's the North Pole's local newspaper. And, um, but this isn't parochial because as the tundra burns in Canada and Siberia, as the ice melts, as nuclear submarines uh, shuffle around the, the polar ice and uh, there are... There are bombers in Norway pointing at Moscow and vice versa. There's a, it's, it's a strategic area. And you might have thought in the old days, the Arctic ice was a barrier to keep warring nations apart. But with the melting of the ice and the opening of the sea passages, it's actually become more of a sort of tripwire for the areas. Um, and there are all sorts of initiatives that have been on and Arne covers them, for example, the Arctic Council, which is uh, a body comprising all of the circumpolar nations, plus China, of course, because you couldn't keep China China out of a global initiative. Um, you have to explain to us where their bridges and tunnels and <laughs> across the network fit into this picture. So um, it is highly strategic. Biden and Putin were discussing things recently, and this is uh, something that almost the only hopeful sign, I think, in the last few years, that they said there would be some type of rapprochement. But uh, it gets more complicated because the United States still hasn't signed the uh, convention, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which has a dispute handling mechanism. So you have the Pentagon and the State Department and lots of other departments in the US government want to uh, stake out a legal claim to the seabed in the in the in the in the polar polar in the arctic ocean uh, but they haven't got any mechanism to do so because the only mechanism involves them signing on for the convention on the law of the sea which uh, the republican um, and diehard isolationists have refused to let them do despite the navy despite the pentagon and despite successive white houses so this is um, this it's, it's an interesting standoff. Um, they are, as you might say, poles apart on this issue. So Arnie, how 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 did you get into the? Uh, how did you set up the, the the High North News? Can you give us some background on it? Yeah, I could try. Thank you for um, thank you for um, letting me join this session, Ian. It's it's a pleasure to meet you guys. So, uh, well, it all started actually many, many years ago when I decided to um, to take a break from uh, national media in, in, in Oslo, where I, normal, where I was hired in, in different national media. And I decided to move uh, to an island called Svalbard, uh, which is a town called Longyearby, and most of you know about that. It's on 78 degrees north, uh, the world's north society, actually. Um, and actually, I was going to, to Svalbard to, to start hunting. I, 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 I compiled for being a hunter, but um, the, uh, the, the camp that I asked for was closed on the same year. So, so I, I wasn't allowed to do that as, as planned. So I had to, to make a plan B. And, and plan B happened to be to ask for being editor in the world's no, northernmost newspaper called Svalbard Posten. That is a really local newspaper actually so that was kind of back to basic uh, of journalism which every journalist should do sometimes i think to go back to the abc actually weddings um, and funerals <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and bazaars and, and, and bingo and whatever i mean uh, talking to children and, uh, and real people not sitting on the telephone actually so uh, but but Svalbard is in a strategic very important part of of, uh, of the world we then with, with, a, with a treaty that is more than 100 years old to regulate, uh, regulate the situation on, on Svalbard, which is a Norwegian land, but international uh, because of the treaty. Um, so from there on, I just tried to go back to the national newspaper in, 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 in Oslo, 
but it seems after staying six years in, in, on Svalbard, it felt pretty dull. So uh, I wanted to go up north again. And going up north um, uh, was not so easy to find an interesting job, actually. So I ended up um, on what's called the High North Center for Business and Governance. And um, after some years working with strategic issues, uh, traveling around, uh, giving lessons and things about Arctic, uh, I decided what, what, what we needed was an independent newspaper that brought news and saw the whole Arctic as once. Uh, as, uh, um, so, so, and I managed to get it financed um, uh, actually from, from different sources, private and public. Um, because this this is not a commercial uh, possibility actually in, 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 in like a normal newspaper. So and, and I got an acceptance from the center after after some years uh, um, with the newspaper. So so well, it all started with interest. How to, I mean, how to how to tell stories from the Arctic and how to cover the Arctic. Uh, and how to reach out to the decision maker actually because they are sitting most of them are sitting far away from the arctic when they take their decision so that is a sh short background actually that's uh, a fascinating one but what are the big issues at the moment i mean there's obviously there's energy there's the military strategic uh bit the submarines uh the right of free passage uh Jonathan Kapstein is just here as uh, asked about the state of maritime transport transit for naval less vessels. Mm. Is there a difference with commercial vessels? So we know the Canadians insist that the Northwest Passage is their domestic waters. Yeah, and the Russians the, are saying uh, the same about the bit near the coast. So what, what are the what are the geostrategic implications here if I want to drive my aircraft carrier through the Northwest? Yeah. Passage? Well, it's changed actually because if you go. If you go, if you, the newspaper now, I think it's six years old. And when we, on, when we started out, um, the main focus was on resources um, in, in the Arctic. Uh, this is before you put a spell on oil. Uh, it's before um, it, it's happened almost at the same time that we got the sanction against Russia. Um, so the situation has changed very much from for being a part of the world where everybody was hunting resources, um, mainly fisheries and uh, new oil resources that goes from Russia to, to, to Alaska. Uh, the last few years, especially since 2014, uh, the main issue is more focused on security issues, security issues. Um, then of course you have the climate change, uh, which is a big part of living in, in, uh, in the Arctic. Um, if I should mention a couple of other things, I, I, I would mention the the um, lack of people. I mean, people, in, people are moving away from the Arctic, which is a big concern for most of the countries that uh, that uh, the eight states that's part of the Arctic. So, um, yeah, um, it has changed. It's, it's not so. I mean, you talked about you mentioned Arctic Council. Um, uh, I listened to Mike Pompeo in, in Rovaniemi a few years ago on an Arctic Council meeting. He, 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 described, he described the Arctic as a scene of war, actually, um, with, uh, with a huge attack on Russia and huge attack on, on, on China. So he put a kind of a spell on, on, on the Arctic cooperation, uh, which was very critical. Um, uh, and after that speech, and after, of course, the sanction against Russia, security issues are, are taking more and more part of the discussion and more and more important for people living in this area. What about, um, I mean, it's a, it's a place of passage uh, with the ships. Uh, how feasible is the transpolar route? Not it's, not so, it, it's, it's not so visible. It's more statistic, actually, for, for, for most of the people. But... Um, we have been following the um, the Northeast Passage for, for years. I even traveled myself to, to Vladivostok a couple of years ago to 
to see where all these ships could end up if uh, if 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 the um, northern um, northeast passage was was open. Um, quite a few ship, um, uh, but increasing a little bit. The pandemic, and you have the situation in the Suez Channel. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly when this huge uh, container ship blocked the... Uh, only the, the, months ago, only months yeah, ago. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that put a new focus on, 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 on the Northern Sea Route, actually, because you have this conflict situation in, in, in the South Pastos, and the Northern Sea Route is shorter, it could be cheaper. And then you have the change in climate, which means that you can sail even more directly than you have been used to do uh, during the last eight to 10 years. So, so the ships just, don't have to hug the coast anymore, they can cut More and across. more, yeah. More and more and longer period uh, during the year. Uh, so for Russia, this is a very important um, uh, part of their uh, business strategy, actually, uh, uh, to get more ships. And they are promoting it very hard. So are our, 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 our Russian companies. Um, promoting the Northern Sea Route very hard. On the other hand, you have this, um, what I call greenwashing from European and, and other international shipping companies that denies to, to sail through this route because they mean uh, that will harm the situation in the Arctic, the animal life and the climate and, and, and things like that. Uh, to be honest, I don't believe them. It's all about money actually, but they, they 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 tell a story about the, how they don't want to use that um, uh, that uh, that area. So maybe in the future, but it's gone slower than we uh, some people um, um, uh, thought it would do. So I mean, the, the Russians have a fleet of icebreakers. Does anybody else? Well, you have uh, Finland has a huge fleet of uh, of icebreakers actually, but they are in yeah. uh, in in they are they are further south actually uh, in 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 the frozen water between Finland and Sweden and and and, and Europe. But they are moving yeah. up north uh, during uh, some periods. Um, the Canadian are building icebreaker. Uh, the United States are building icebreakers. It seems like everybody is starting to build icebreaker when there is no more ice to break uh, because of the <laughs> climate change. So it's pretty funny. It seems like some of these uh, so-called icebreaker is more meant for carrying um, uh, more military equipment than they are to to commercial uh, commercial uh, shipping. Um, so it's a paradox. So, of the, do the Chinese have an icebreaker yet? They are building a lot of icebreakers. They, they as well. They are. they are building. They are building icebreakers. So, icebreaker is if you want to put your money in something that we probably won't need in twenty years, you put it in icebreakers. Mm. So, are we going to get a nine dotted line in the uh, in the yeah. Arctic Ocean? <laughs> the Chinese <laughs> discover there's a reef there that they've happened to build uh, build a platform on. You could actually, um, because it's it's um, it, it, it's strange. I, I I could understand it if it started some years ago, but it's harder to understand just actually now. But on the other hand, uh, the decision makers don't believe in the climate crisis mostly, so uh, I guess they they will continue to build their icebreakers. Well, climate crisis is a good one. Um... Jonathan Capstein says again, when he was a news bureau chief in Canada during the 70s, there was great interest in oil exploration in the high Arctic. Uh, uh, Panarctic oils found huge dome structures, but they were largely dry except for natural gas, which was ignored. So well, what's the current state of um, energy extraction in, in, in the polar region? It is, um, as, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it used to be one of the drivers uh, in the Arctic or or the high north. Um, um, when I say high north, it, it's more to amplify that this area is industrialized, that lives people. Uh, we use high north because to tell the story about people living here, the industry living here. When you say Arctic, uh, uh, it's more association to polar bears and, 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 and areas which are not populated at all, just to, to clear that up but oil used to be one of the drivers it, it it's not anymore actually it's um 
it's been drilling and it's still drilling on the Norwegian part and the Russian part. Um, but so far, they haven't found so much of the oil and gas that they thought. One interesting aspect as a journalist about when you ask about the oil situation or the energy situation in the, in the high north, um, one of the last political decisions in Norway was to open up a field close to the Russian border. Uh, the line in the sea between Russia and and, <coughs> uh, and Norway, and in the agreement between Russia and and, and Norway on this uh, border, which is uh, one of the newest border in the world, actually uh, uh, going in 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 the Barents Sea, they decided to cooperate because if they find oil on the Norwegian side, they also will find oil on the Russian side, so they need to cooperate. Uh, to take off this, or if there is oil in, in, in this area. Uh, so in a way, Norway and Russia, uh, uh, and this was decided before the, uh, the, the, uh, the embargo against Russia on, on, on oil, the, uh, the sanctions. So if Norway find oil, they are forced to cooperate with Russia on drilling and, uh, and, and, and producing oil from, from the Barents Sea. That could be a very interesting situation, actually. This also leads on to, a, I mean, it's, it, it's a dilemma for people in the high north is that uh, prosperity might lie through prospecting for oil, but the tundra is burning, the ice is melting. So, you know, <laughs> the, 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 they actually suffer more than most people from, um, unlike, you know, desertification, I suppose, is not a big issue in the polar regions. No, but All I the mean, rest of it is. It's, um, it's true. Uh, it's true. Um, on the other hand, um, if you if you look at the Arctic states, uh, the northern part of Norway, well, we have some oil activity, we have some delivering to to the oil industry, but that is not a very big part of the economy of the northern part of Norway. If you go to Alaska, um, you see the situation is different. You have a different welfare system and different social system than you have in most uh, of the Arctic states. Uh, uh, People are depending on the oil production in, uh, in, in, in a way that we, we are not uh, in, in, in northern part of Norway. Um, and I, I see the discussion in, 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 in the United States is very different than it is in Norway because we can afford to say no to the oil. Uh, people living in Alaska can probably not say uh, can't afford actually to to say no to 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 more producing of oil energy, but this is kind of regulated by the market because you will see if you look at investment in oil industry, you will see that there was almost nobody that wanted to drill for oil in Alaska, and, and the same situation will be if you go further north of of Norway up to 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 Svalbard and f closer to the North Pole, it, it's probably not commercial. Uh, at all to drill for oil. Well, that, that brings in another aspect that's interesting about the Arctic Council is that uh, there's all of the indigenous peoples around the polar rim. Uh, you know, the, the, my, my, I mentioned to you before we started talking about my Sami great, 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 great grandmother. Um, you have the Inuits, uh, you have the Eskimos, as they still call themselves in Alaska, I discovered when I went there, the Yakuts and the others across in uh, Siberia. So, I mean, these, I gather these uh, indigenous peoples are talking and conferring on common issues. Is that right? Are you a forum for this? The, 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 the Arctic Council is very much for, from, for indigenous people. Uh, it, when Arctic Arti Council started some 25 years ago, um, one of the main issues was actually indigenous people. And the indigenous people across the Arctic, uh, I think Iceland is the only country that doesn't have uh, uh, indigenous people actually in, 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 in their state. Uh, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, of course, uh, Finland, uh, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and, and, and um, United States in, in Alaska. But the indigenous people was a very, big part of, 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 um, of Arctic Council and, and in, in my opinion and I cooperate with a lot of indigenous people and organizations they are very well organized and they are um, a, a very um, solid part of, of the Arctic Council and highly respected actually. 
So what, what are their major concerns that they can confer and try to get international action about? Uh, sorry, could you say that again? I'm... Well, what are their major concerns? Uh, what, uh, is it protection uh, um... of indigenous rights, developing the economy, ensuring social security? It's Even one of the houses the, warm. Yeah, yeah, one of the one of the uh, one of the main issues is the right to land. Actually, it's um, and it's a very different situation between uh, between uh, again, you see the the difference between the um, let's say the Norwegian indigenous people, which are highly highly respected and 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 and, and accepted and 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 a part of every decision. If you move to Alaska, and, and I had the fortune to to follow the Idita rot uh, some years oh, ago. Yeah. yeah, I mean that is every journalist, journalist should do things like that actually. But so I visited a lot of these small villages in Alaska, and, and, and it's a totally different situation. Uh, no roads, uh, depending on, on planes uh, to get between. Um, lack of jobs, lack of welfare system. So they have other worries actually than, uh, than, 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 than other indigenous people. But the struggle for land and to keep, keep um, the land free and, and, and to do the business they want is, is one. But the climate, of course, also for the indigenous people, um, because a lot of them are depending on, on, on frozen, uh, frozen land uh, to the, the guys who are dealing with reindeers and reindeer herds. Um, so, so I think that is the main concern for, for them. Yeah, um, is there a big export market for reindeer meat? I've enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a market, they're still producing and, and, and I enjoy eating it. You, you'll find a lot of good food from the reindeer actually, yeah. If they can keep the lichen, they can keep the lichen, <laughs> but help the reindeer. Um, what, what is the, I mean, the, the other issue that comes in there is the fisheries. Because obviously, the uh, with, with the temperature changes, there have been shifts in the fishery population. I mean, our, our our areas that were previously uncontested now becoming contested because that's where the fish are. You know, are the well, cod we, moving north or? Well, that is a prediction, I am more than a fact so far. Uh, so far, I mean, but the prediction is that that the the, the um, uh, like the cod uh, would. Probably uh, find other places to 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 uh, to uh, track, um, but it's it for Norway to, to speak for Norway um, again on fisheries and, and and for Iceland. This is a very big part of the economy. It's it's much bigger than than oil industry and and, and other industries. So it's uh, much bigger in economic terms or in social impact. The number of no, bo bo both both actually both actually uh, fishery and and. One of the challenges in the fishing industry for Arctic people or people in the high north is that uh, a lot of the investment and the ownership is other places than in the Arctic or in the high north. It's, it's owned by it's owned by people far away from 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 the hotspot actually. So, but I, I could see when I, I I've, I've been traveling around now during the pandemic in in. in in, in the northern part of Norway, because the border was closed, so I couldn't travel where I normally used to go. Um, but it's it's a, it's a lot of people to meet and industry to meet in the northern part of Norway. So I, I kept going for three months up in the north during the, the pandemic this winter. And and if you look at the fisheries, you will find some of the most international and most modern technological industries that you can dream about. I mean, it's 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 amazing to see how. How, 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 how they are taking care of the whole fish. Um, but they are depending, as Arctic people are, on the international market. So when you ask about concern more generally, uh, um, in my point of view, one of the concerns is that the international cooperation on business and politics has a breakdown, uh, mostly caused by, by the conflict between the United States and and, and uh, and Russia, and, and mostly because of Donald Trump, of course, that is a really big concern for, for people working in the, in the high north, because we don't eat the fish ourselves. I mean, we don't use the oil ourselves. We are, we are depending on exporting it on a, on a free market to get paid, actually. So that's a lot of concern going on on the nationalism, if I, if I could be 
so free to call it the, the, the growing nationalism around the world, actually. Well, the fish, uh, it's strange how um, hot an issue fisheries are in terms of nationalism. I mean, it's, it's, nothing seems to bring out nationalism the way the fisheries do. And the, you know, the, the European Union fisheries are a minuscule part of the European economy. <laughs> but you'd never <laughs> guess this to listen to the French or the Spanish or the Canadians. Wow. You, know, the, you know, we're almost on the verge of getting armadas facing each other across the North Sea or the, the, the famous Codwell with Iceland. Uh, that is, over, uh, over who, I mean, it's not as though the fish have passports, but <laughs> our no, fish it's, uh, no, but, uh, that is true, but it, it, it's true what you're saying, and actually, it, it, it's a lot of conflicts uh, going on, and we, we have this one between, uh, since since the Brexit, actually, you had new conflicts with, between Norway and, and, and Britain, uh, who, who are allowed to take the fish. On the other hand, fisheries are probably the most complicated thing a journalist can go into and try to understand. I mean, it's, it's so regulated in so many different ways and, 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 and it's different regulated in every nation. Um, on the other hand, again, if you... How do you regulate you, a fish that doesn't stay still? No, that is, no. <laughs> but I mean, every, from buying it, selling it, producing it, and, <laughs> and everything is very regulated. But one of the one of the best example on cooperation in the Arctic actually is about fisheries, and that is the, uh, the agreement between Norway and Russia and how to take care of the fishery, uh, the fishes in the Barents Sea, actually. We, during the sanction, during the Cold War, uh, during every crisis that has been between East and West, they have still been negotiating and agreed on how much fish we are allowed to take out of the sea, these, these two nations. So that is an example for other countries to, uh, mm, to but, look at. But didn't they find out uh, post Gorbachev that um, the Russians happily signed the things and then vacuumed up any fish that were there regardless of the consequences? Well, um, I, 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 I wouldn't confirm that history, but um, in recent year at least but but for a long period this is uh, this is a remarkable good cooperation actually between these two countries that have, nothing has been able to stop it and 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 the scientists that i mean in my view one of the best negotiators in the world are the people working with fisheries actually they they could be used in peace cooperation operation situation between other countries and maybe we should send some of the negotiation from fisheries to Syria or, 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 or something to, 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 to stop the conflict. A lot of the Euphrates, it's an interesting thought. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the actual high seas fishery stocks are, are, are they're in an abysmal state across the world because all of these agreements are being flouted, whether it's uh, Chinese, Taiwanese, Spanish trawlers, whatever. I, I, I remember when the issue was at the United Nations and people were laughing because they had a whole conference on, what was it? Highly migratory and straddling fish stocks. Okay. I love the title because a straddling yeah. fish stock, it sounded like a coelacanth coming yeah. on the yeah. land, straddling, crawling up the beach. But it was a very, very important issue because very you know, important. If, 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 the fish, if the fish stock floats from one side of a boundary to the other and one side vacuums it all up, then it's not a very good agreement when you know the, the last few minnows reach the other side and, and can't breed anymore, and, and that seems to be what's happening. I, I remember the uh, between the French and the Canadians are Saint Pierre and Miquelon, which is where, where the they, they were the, the, the Canadians brought a, a ship with one of the fine meshed trawler nets into oh. New York Harbor to show what was happening. Uh, because the European fisheries were coming straight in and vacuuming fish right up to the boundary line with Canada, which, you know, as you pointed out, it's a straddling fish stock, so it had deleterious effects on both sides. That's true, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, you, you, you think the fish stocks in the Arctic are fairly safe for now? No, no, I, 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 I'm not a I'm not a scientist, so so I, I wouldn't say so. But so far, we have taken good care of it, and uh, and better care of it than all the places in the world, uh, due to cooperation in the Arctic. And that is that is what is fascinating about working in the Arctic, because um, different from other organizations, um, the Arctic Council actually is an organization with 
with states in the area, uh, which has stakeholders in the area, uh, while other organizations are, are based on, the, I mean, not depending so much on each other. So, so they, if, if there should live people, if you, if you, in the Arctic and the high north, um, you need this kind of cooperation. Actually, you need it on fisheries, you need it on oil, and you need it mainly. And that's a big problem these days. You need it on security, and and, and we are living in the middle of weapons that has never been regulated in that, any treaty. I mean, all the treaties you have are either spoiled by Donald Trump or established before all this weapon we see around us uh, uh, this year. Um, and without the good neighborhood and the good, uh, the good uh, cooperation, uh, this could be an actual and dangerous uh, situation. And that is that's actually why I see a hope when, when, when Joe Biden and, 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 and President Putin sit down and have a discussion uh, at, at the last uh, Arctic uh, Council meeting uh, on, 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 on minister level, um, uh, the same day as Russia took over the, uh, the, uh, the Arctic Council. Uh, this is a meeting place. They have to meet. They, 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 they can't just step out of this. And the uh, and, and, and United States is a nation that I've been dealing with wars all around the world, uh, uh, in, in other countries. They are just some 80 kilometers away from Russia if you go from the, the, the Alaskan side to, uh, to, to Russia. So this is actually two neighbors that, that, that meet in Arctic Council. And they meet as neighbors, not only as enemies. Did you see any flashpoint? I mean, it was interesting in a sort of historical context to see, uh, OK, he is slightly deranged. But Donald Trump suddenly decided that Greenland was a useful piece of real estate and he wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> do you see any war? Are the, are the Japanese and the Chinese going to discover that Siberia is really a nice place and they want to build beachside resorts on the... Yeah, but I mean, his, <laughs> historically, uh, this kind of... Areas have changed a lot. I mean, Norway used to, to, to have both Iceland and... Shetland and and and, and, Farrah and and Alaska was Russia until the United States uh, bought it from 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 Russia. So so, so we changed. But now, joke aside or history aside, um, what Donald Trump understood uh, actually was that Greenland, uh, because of the military strategic situation, is getting more important than it has been since the Cold War. Uh, so the Americans are re-establishing their defense forces on, on Greenland as they do in, in, in Norway. And the Danish are talking about militarizing Greenland in a way that they haven't done for many, many years. So, so the strategic so there's, there's growing pressure for autonomy in Greenland. Does that get as far as independence yet? Uh, did you ask if Greenland is independence? Yes. Is there, yeah, no, well. There is probably a majority on, on, on Greenland who, who want independence from, uh, from Denmark. Uh, that well, is they, one of... they want independence or autonomy, because if you remember, I think it was the pharaohs, when they asked for independence, said, okay, but we the subsidies stop. Oh, let's reconsider this. Uh, <laughs> let's... Well, well on, on the other hand, pharaoh is pretty... It's, it's a small country, but they have a very good economy. Um, Greenland is so huge. Uh, uh, it's hard to establish a local economy. Um, they are, I mean, they have been flirting and discussing investment with the Chinese for years. Uh, other companies have a mining uh, business uh, on, on Greenland. But the main problem actually is the economy uh, to be independent. You need to, to balance your budget. Um, so if you can get more independence and uh, get money from the kingdom of Denmark, they, they probably choose to, to, to have more independence actually. Uh, but Greenland, I mean, it, it's changed so much in the last few years. So, so it's hardly reckon I mean, people are moved from the small cities and into the into Nuke and, and 
And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a quite a complicated situation, both social, political, and, 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 and economic, uh, financial for, for Greenland, and, and it's a pity. But I could imagine that uh, heavy Chinese investment in Greenland would be cause ripples in Washington and Ottawa, and not to mention Copenhagen. Yeah, well, um, that has a lot of this, you know, have, have changed because of the way we look at China. Um, um, China is a big bad wolf in, in, in this game, actually, because suddenly, all by a sudden, um, China was a treat to, 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 to every nation around the world, actually. I, I, I don't say it is, I say it, it is. It's the way we look at China, and, and uh, well, that makes the situation in Greenland and, and in, in most of the other countries pretty complicated. Um, uh, Russia, on their side, are forced into a cooperation with uh, with China, and, and welcome it in the Council. Uh, United States, when Mike Pompeo again talked in, in Rovaniemi, he wouldn't accept China as an observer state or a part of, of, of Arctic at all. So it, it's complicated. And, and, and as you know, small countries like Norway are depending on what the United States decides. So no, it's not popular to deal with China from Norway either. Um, so and, and the Chinese, of course, don't want to invest in when they don't get any back politically. Um. Jonathan Kapstein again wants to know, speaking of indigenous peoples, uh, for decades there was a highly skilled creative tradition of soapstone culture in the Canadian high Arctic. Is there some sort of mutual marketing system for uh, high Arctic indigenous products? There was one of those at the United Nations you know, back in the foyer. Of, uh, uh, I think it was a gift from Canada, or I'm not quite sure. No, I, 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 I don't know either. I, I, I know, no, I, I'm not sure if you have any um, united. I mean, this is people living very far away from each other and in very different ways. So we can't, we can't look at indigenous people as, as one group, actually. They are, they are living very different around the, um, around the Arctic. And um, uh, in Alaska, it's, it's mainly fishing now, uh, if, if you have any traditional. Um, so no, I, I don't think so. I, I, not, not that I am aware of, no. And one of the other indigenous traditions, which is a big international thing, is the question of whaling. Um, so how, how many Japanese research ships are counting how many whales they can kill in the course of a, 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 a voyage at the moment in the Arctic? Or is that not their main hunting ground? No, the Japanese are not in, in, uh, in, in, in the Arctic, actually. but but. When you are mentioning whaling, I am. It is it's quite interesting because this is an example how the rest of the world uh, looks at the Arctic and want to decide what's going on in the Arctic and the High North. Uh, they want to ban uh, the whaling. Why scientists appear uh, have all the reason to say that we are. It is fully possible to 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 have an industry based on 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 whaling. You had a situation um, some years ago, talking about Greenland, uh, where the where the European Union uh, by uh, decided to 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 um, boycott or or or, or stop um, uh, the possibility for Inuits on Greenland to sell uh, products made from seal. Uh, because some activists, some green activists, decided. Uh, Bardo, as I remember. Yeah, that's right, and 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 that is still an example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is still uh, an example of how misunderstood people in the Arctic actually could be, because this is the most traditional way of living, and 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 the European Union wanted to to to, to ban it, and, and it still hurts. Mm -hmm. But that is the way we are used to live, and that's why you need High North News, actually, because who tells the story from, from the High North? Who, 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 who meet the people and, 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 and show that we are... It's a very good place to live. Uh, I was in a debate some years ago with some of our colleagues from 
some uh, American newspapers, some Chinese newspapers, some Indian newspaper, I think, and a couple of other nations. And we were sitting in a panel and dis discussing uh, Arctic journalism or high north journalism. And, and these guys told me that if they tried to sell a story, the editor on the desk never published it if they didn't mention at least polar bear once. Uh, <laughs> so that, that is one of the reasons you have the high nose news actually because this is you can carry good. stories without a polar bear in. yeah we can and, and we can even write stories without mentioning climate yeah, yeah. i've got a, just just a passing thought for you but um Bundaberg rum in australia which is close to the antarctic at the opposite end of the world its uh, signature emblem is a polar bear Okay. <laughs> I've never quite worked this out, but you might be able to exploit yeah. it at some point. <laughs> Maybe you can get Bundaberg, uh, the rum company, to um, to take advertising space. In, that's, in the that's a good one. Yeah, we, we had the polar bear as a symbol in when I was the editor of Svalbard Post. The polar bear was a symbol of the newspaper, actually. <laughs> but we had it. We had it just outside the office door, so that was not so strange. Yeah, so a bottle, well, a bottle of Bundaberg rum would be a fair <laughs> from, from 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 the Australian side. It's um, so. Are there any? What are the special challenges about reporting? I mean, obviously, it's difficult to travel those distances. You must rely on local correspondence and local input. But you know, how do you how do you investigate news? Well. Uh, I travel a lot. If you before the pandemic, I, I, I had a, like two hundred days tra of traveling around in the Arctic because Arctic is huge, and and, and, uh, and that is that that was my way of, of, of covering the Arctic. Uh, I think that will change now. I mean, we, we, because we will never get back to that situation, and and that is probably good <laughs> both for, for for my health and for journalism that we. Uh, Take it a little bit slower. Um, it used to be many conferences about the high north and the Arctic around the world, actually, and, and, and in the Arctic. That was a natural plot for us to participate. But our journalism is we make the newspaper, but we also do a lot of, 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 of debates, arranged debates uh, between people. We have um, workshops and we uh, uh, we do a lot of talking uh, on, on, on this conference to to um, to actually um, tell stories from uh, from from uh, from from the high north. Um, when you it all goes, of course, we call it local newspaper for for, for the Arctic, and I, I love the phrase actually. Uh, on the other hand, we we don't. Our stories are more international, actually, most of them, uh, most of them are, uh, but that's a mix of stories about people. I mean, to tell the stories from the people living in this area and more international stories covering like security and climate and industry. Um, so uh, it, it's both about how to live in the Arctic, uh, uh, what people think, during the pandemic, actually, if, if I mention it, 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 it's, it was kind of like people in the Arctic was forgotten because we didn't, you only was visible if you had the uh, coronavirus. So you weren't dying enough. Yeah, we was, wasn't dying enough. That's right. So, so it, it seems like everybody forgot people living in the north. We, we, we didn't have the COVID in the same way. So it was a strange situation. Um, but it's... Um, we have stringers around in the Arctic who report. We have mainly picked journalists that has competence on, let's say, European Union and how they deal with Arctic issues. We have journalists and, and editorials about people who, as you mentioned, the Northern Sea Route. Uh, we have people who know about the security issues, uh, uh, climate, uh, and so on. And I don't know how local they feel themselves, but they're trying to have a kind of an Arctic identity in, 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 in the way we work. So you will, we have our main staff in, in a town in Norway called Buda, but you will seldom or never find a story from Buda in, in, in newspaper, actually. It's, uh, uh, um, 
So, well, yeah, I guess well, it's, that's important. It's, yeah. it's, it's this okay. It's it, it's a local newspaper, but it's not parochial. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So is there anything else you'd like to tell me? Uh, we will begin to wind up. No, I, I think you have covered uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, if I should say something in the end, one of the one of the things, one of the main thing um, in the security discussion, in the military discussion. I, I mean, the military itself, uh, the the ex expanding military budget all around the world uh, spoils the climate it, as, 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 uh, 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 um, uh, as, yeah, um, you know what I mean. I, I didn't find the right word. And, and it seems like everybody or the decision maker are talking about climate, but they are putting more and more money into the military industry, which in itself spoils. The other thing about the security situation is the most important thing for a country like Norway, like Sweden, like Finland, uh, uh, Greenland and so on, is the people living there. If you don't have people in this area, you have no protection at all. It's, it's, it's not necessary to take any... It's easier to invade the northern part of Norway to say it is if it doesn't live people in the northern part of Norway, if somebody wanted to do that. So, so the important thing is to find strategic or political or economical um, possibilities to keep people in the north, uh, and that is for the whole Arctic. Uh, that is for Russia, that is for Alaska, that is for other countries, and, and that is one of the main concerns because all demographic statistics tells that, like you and me, we are getting older and we are not going to... Uh, Speak for yourself. Okay. Carry on. Yeah. So, and we need uh, we need the young. We, we need to find a way to 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 young people. And and the, on a positive side, but it goes too slowly. Um, during the pandemic, everybody has to travel in in their own country. You can't travel much. Uh, it seems like the northern part of Norway and and other part of the Arctic is is being more. Uh, the young people really love what they find and find a way of living that is quite different from from London and New York and and, and the big uh, the big cities. So that is a little hope that the, the young people will take care of us. Yeah. <laughs> Inshallah, as they say, in another part of the world. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, Caitlin, can you run these shows? What we have coming up, please. Uh, thanks, Arne. This has been a really sort of instructive. It's nice to look at a piece of world that is usually overlooked. I really appreciate <laughs> you that. Know, it you overlooks that everybody you, else. <laughs> I really appreciate that you took your time, uh, Arne, to, to do this. Uh, so thank you very much to, uh, to you and your organization for, for bringing it's, me in. Thank it's you. in deference to my Sami great, great six times removed grandmother <laughs> that I've discovered recently. <laughs> And, that, is very, uh, that is very good. Not to mention her husband who tried to convert everybody to teetotalism and to come off alcohol. I don't know whether it worked up there. It certainly didn't work with his other descendants <laughs> over this side of it. So, uh, Caitlin, do we have the um, what's up next, please? Yes, I'm working on pulling it up right now. Okay, so we have lots of other things coming up. We're coming towards the General Assembly. We have... Uh, Web, uh, webinars, press conferences on Brazil. We have uh, Shashi Taror is making a reappearance. He had COVID last time. That is the uh, member of the Indian Parliament who used to be at the United Nations. We, we have a fairly star-studded cast of, uh, of, of, of speakers coming up. Um, and all of them, we hope, are interesting that you follow up the stories. Uh, any of you who want to write about the Arctic, I'm sure if you get hold of Arnie and we will participate, we, we will facilitate this, we'll put you in touch with his correspondence, his, uh, his whaling correspondent in Nunavut or whoever he is. Um, <laughs> and uh, we can... Um, we will I'm, be able... Yep. I, I've just sent it. It's not allowing me to screen share. Uh, uh but I've just sent a slide of the upcoming briefings into the chat. So oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, can you see? Is, is that on the screen? 
No, oh. I can't see it, but uh, oh, okay. Well, I can read them. But next week, yeah, we have, I've uh, I screen shared it. I, I mean, I shared it into the chat, so people will be able to download. Okay, it I've, I've just clicked it and opened it. Um, we have uh, we have the Olympic uh, Atomic Olympics. Uh, we have Alan Ware, a campaigner for many years on climate for the United Nations, about the atomic implications of the Japanese uh, Olympics. Um, we have next week beyond earth solar power from space uh with the beyond uh, beyond earth institute uh, about um how you don't have to go to the arctic to get energy you can get it from orbit uh, the sun never sets out there apparently uh beef bibles and bullets brazil in the age of bolsonaro with richard lapper about his new book and in september we have a decade with peter jennings who was there for many years the dean of foreign correspondence in uh New York, which uh, in America, which wasn't that difficult because there weren't that many of them, unfortunately, but Peter Jennings was a good one. So we have a lot of things coming up. Please sign up on our page, join the Foreign Press Association. Uh, this is Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association in New York, saying goodbye and uh, thank you very much to Arne Holm and we hope to see him again soon in uh, non-contentious circumstances <laughs> but when there isn't something catastrophic that gets his, gets our attention. Thank you Thank very you much. much. Thank you. Okay, bye Arnie. Bye. <laughs> it's been good talking to you. Same to you.